Thank you, Holy Spirit. Tonight, we'll be impacted with your word. We'll be impacted with your truth. And we'll receive our inheritance tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I declare both those that are here and those that are following online, the burdens are lifted, yokes are destroyed right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you happy to be here? Can you turn around and just greet the people around you? Say, I'm happy to be here, and I believe you are too. Praise God. Hallelujah. Indeed, the blessing of the Lord eats, makes rich, and it adds no sorrow with it. You know, if you don't come to terms with God's mindset concerning you, you will not enjoy his blessings. The way God thinks is completely different from the way we think. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, we've been talking about um, being created in God's image. And also, I titled it A People of Prophecy. Praise God. A people of prophecy. And when we say people of prophecy, we are talking about the very first prophecy that God declared from his mouth concerning man. And what did God say? He said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. That word came out from the mouth of God. Praise God. That word came out from the mouth of God. So it is a prophecy. And I've been showing you from the past two weeks now how that was what God said. But Adam was not in the image and likeness of God. Not because God changed his mind, but because it's a journey that God started. Praise God. It's a journey that God started. And that journey is a process. So they started in the Garden of Eden. And right in the Garden of Eden, there's a tree that's, there are several trees in that garden. I know the truth about that Garden of Eden. Do you know every tree had a name? Every tree in that garden had a name. Now, we're only told about two, the names of two. And what's that? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then there was another tree called the tree of life, right? But every tree in that garden had a name. Now, the names of those trees depicts the assignment. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Now, because when you, when you, when you read the book of Revelation, John, from the visions he was seeing, he saw uh, a new Jerusalem. He saw a, new whole, a whole new city. And he said, on, in that city, there were trees. And he said, those trees were for the healing of the nations. Now, he just generalized them that those trees are for what? The healing of the nations. But everything, see, one thing we must realize and come to the understanding of is that God does everything purposefully. Oh, you don't realize it. Jesus said that even the very hair of your head, they are numbered. Now, when Jesus said they are numbered, he didn't mean God counts them. Like, how many, maybe you have, you know, imagine how many strands of hair on your head. But what, what he meant when he says they are numbered, it actually means they are coded. They are coded. The hair on your head, every one of it has a coat. Now, if they all have a coat, 
They are all for a reason. How many of you have seen some, not electrical wires, now some computer cables before? How many of you have seen computer, real computer cables? You see one cable like this, when you see the edge, you see plenty wires. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Or oh, those, those days, telephone cables, but computer cables, some cables like this, you know, those days, now these days, you do more of USB and all that, or HDMI, but those days where you have, what they call those cables now, you have a cable that has up to 30 teats. <laughs> you understand? The, the, the mouth, you just socket it inside that thing. And you see, when you look at, when you remove that head, you see plenty wires, and you wonder. Ah. But guess what? Each one of those wires is for something specific. And if you cut one, that thing will not function well. So all those wires were all for a specific reason. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, God says the very hair of your head, they are coded. Meaning every strand of your hair has a purpose. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Now, if your hair can be that delicate, how much more every other thing that God created? So every plant, God will not just say, in this place, let 100 trees grow. No, if 100 trees are in that place, every tree has its purpose. Every, every tree has its name. Now that's the beauty of creation that we have not experienced even till this day. You understand what I'm saying? God created everything so beautiful. Sometimes, I don't know if you sit down to imagine. Well, you can't imagine it because there's nothing that can depict it. Depict it. Nothing. But the Spirit of God can take you into places like that, that you begin to have an idea how beautiful that garden was. And you know the funny thing? God wanted the whole world to be exactly the way that garden was, with improvement, of course. Are you following? Are you following me? Now, you, I know you just think in your mind that the Garden of Eden was just a garden, no house, you know. So where was Adam and Eve sleeping? Maybe when they are tired, they'll sleep on the floor or <laughs> lean on a tree and sleep. How many of you have thought about it? Do you think that's how the Garden of Eden was? Do you think that's how the Garden of Eden was? Remember, remember, the Garden of Eden was not the whole world. The Garden of Eden was not even the whole of Eden. In Eden, there was a garden. Are you listening? So Eden was a place that had a garden. Now, we were not told the kind of houses God made for them. But don't think that God just threw them out there and said, when it rain falls, we're going to look for one tree you know, that has white leaves you know, to go and fetch on them, doing like this, <laughs> waiting for the rain. Do you think that's how they were living their lives? No. God prepared a place for them. And the place was beautiful. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That in that garden, there were trees that had, see, ah, thank you, Holy Spirit. See, every tree, every fruit had its purpose. And God was teaching Adam and Eve to identify how and what to eat. I'm telling you the truth. You remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and Moses was speaking to them in Exodus, God said to them, he said, if you follow and obey everything God wants you to do, he said, God's going to do two things. He's going to bless your bread and he's going to bless your water. And then he says, and I will put none of these diseases upon you which I put on the Egyptians. Take note. He says, I will bless your bread and I will bless your water. And I will put none of these diseases. Now that should give you an idea that diseases come from things you eat. I hear what I'm saying. Sicknesses, diseases, they come from things you eat. So God says, hey, if you do everything I command you to do, this is going to be my response. I will bless your bread. I will bless your water. Now, he created it. Are you getting it? It's not God that created water. So why is God now saying, I will bless your water? 
He says, what he's actually saying is, I will take the poisoning thing from it. Some of you don't realize why we bless food before we eat. It's not, oh, Father, I thank you for this food. No, see, when we bless food, it's something very spiritual we are doing. Paradventure, you see, because you cannot start sitting down and start trying to understand who made this food, how did they make the food, what, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, some people say, oh, don't eat some things because they are genetically, minini, minini, you know, all those kind of stories. Hey, Jesus actually told us concerning the one who believes in him. He said, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Why won't it hurt them? Because he takes responsibility to blessing whatever they eat. So God is concerned about what comes into your mouth. He's concerned about what you eat. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Are you understanding what I'm saying? And if you, if you become conscious of the things that God is conscious about, then that's one, one easy way to even walk in divine health. I'm telling you the truth. You walk in divine health so easily. How? Be conscious, and this is where you start from, be conscious of blessing your bread and your water. But before you think of blessing your bread and your water, making up your mind to function with God in complete obedience. That's what he said. He says, so you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your what? Bread and water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. So you shall what? Serve the Lord your God. And let me tell you something. God did not call us to serve him like servants serving a wicked master. The reason God called us to serve him is so that we can understand him and be like him. Are you getting what I'm saying? So everything God tells you to do, number one, there are things he can do for himself. And there are things that he does. So everything he tells you to do, he's training you to begin to walk in his ways. And when you walk in his ways, you're becoming like him. And that's why Jesus says, uh, he says, no, John told us that his commandments are not grievous. Why? Because some people think, ah, can you imagine? Ah, to follow God is not easy eh? every time. Hey, he said his commandments are not grievous. Why? Because he's too concerned about you becoming his image and his likeness. So he gave us his spirit, like I shared with you two weeks ago and last week, he gave us his spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. And I told you how the Holy Ghost is connected to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives makes us to know what is good and evil. Now, having known that, because your journey begins from when you begin to descend good and evil. That's when your journey in life begins. Until you can start discerning that you don't move anywhere. There is nothing that can be entrusted into your hands. Not spiritual things. So, having received the Holy Spirit now, and, and, and you are beginning to differentiate this is good and this is evil, not because of what somebody said, but because the Holy Spirit in you is teaching you that thing. Give me First John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Sali barakata yednehikitiya. First John chapter 2, sorry. Verse 27. First John 2, 27. Quickly, please. It says, I want you to watch this. It says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and not a lie, just as he has taught you, 
you will abide in him. Now, you look at the scripture and you're wondering, okay, so the anointing teaches you all things, okay? But see, what he was actually telling you here, he was teaching you about making choices. So he says, you don't need anybody to teach you what choices to make. Are you getting what I'm saying? Why? Because the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is to teach you what is good and what is evil. Now, because you have the Holy Spirit in your life, say you don't need anybody to advise you. He is not saying you don't need anybody to explain things to you. You know, like we'll say, ah, because of this scripture, there's no need to go to church now. The Holy Spirit will teach me everything. <laughs> Praise God. And, but then you know it has never worked like that. He teaches you some things. The Holy Spirit goes teaches. I get what I'm saying. But what John was basically talking about here. He says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. Teach you what? The knowledge of good and evil. Because that is the main work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the main work of the anointing in your life. To make you know what is good and what is evil. And then he says, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things... Because here's the truth. Even when you're listening to somebody, when you're listening to somebody, there are decisions you're making in your heart. Is this person telling me the truth or is this person telling me a lie? Do you understand? Should I follow this person or should I not follow this person's counsel? Every day, you know, someone tells you, hey, will you eat? So the question comes, should I eat now or should I eat later? Are you getting what I'm saying? Oh, can you come over to my house? Should I go now or should I go at all? Are you getting it? So everything that brings knowledge to you, you are thrown the ability to make decisions. So everything in life, someone said this thing is red, you still have to make a decision. Should I believe him or should I not believe him? Now you see why it was so important that God had to plan for that. That the knowledge of good and evil will be placed right inside you. Because the deceiver is in this world. And his job is to draw you away. So if you don't have, if you need somebody, if you have to wait for somebody to come and tell you, okay, this one is the right one, this one is the wrong one, you, you may lose your life before you know it. So God planned it such a way. Remember what Paul says. He said he's able to make all grace abound towards you. That you having all sufficiency in all things may abound to Every good work. He's talking about the same thing. A business proposal comes. The decision, should I take it or should I not take it? Is it good or is it bad? Every minute, every second of the day, you're making decisions. You're going out. You stand by the junction. The first car comes. Should I take it or should I not take it? Are you getting what I'm saying? Oh, someone say, ah, I'm scared. I don't want to enter one chance. That's why the anointing is in you. You, you, you see a vehicle, you're, you're excited to enter. The moment you open the door, you just said, this is not the right vehicle. It's okay. You guys, um, something, no, I changed my mind. Ah, no, come in. Ah, no, sorry, I changed my mind. Because the anointing was in you. Now, you see, that is where your journey in becoming the image and likeness of God begins because that is exactly what god does in everything before he began to create the first thing he said was light be and light was he had to bring light and when he created that light what did he do this is good and this is bad you understand what i'm saying he said he called the light day and the darkness he called night so he had to bring that separation but now what he wanted was to create day, right? Talk to me now, right? He wanted to create day. Before that day came, everywhere was dark. The Bible said darkness was on the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And when God said, let there be light, it's not the sunlight that came. No, it wasn't. Because if you read a few verses down, you see, and God created the sun and the moon and many stars. He created them. So if he now created the sun and the moon, then when he said, let there be light, what came? Praise God. It was the plan of God that he carried in his heart for the whole world. 
That's what, you know, like an architect would draw a, a model, right? You know how they draw not just the paper plan. These days they, don't, they, these days they do 3D and, and, and do it on the computer. But you know what I'm talking about? But in those days they would, they would build something with cardboard, right? You build something with cardboard and put it in a glass. And when you go, they see a whole university complex inside this glass. You look at, wow, wow, is this how this is going to be like? Now, that was when God said, let there be light. That was what came before him. The plan of the whole world came before him. And it was from that light he began to speak into the darkness. So that's what he called, this is day. And all this darkness that exists is night. His job now is to cause the day to overshadow the night. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And guess what? That is the same responsibility that he has given to us. That's the same responsibility that he's given to us. Because the world is so full of darkness. 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 Give me 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Liparoto sekina mahangadia. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse, from verse 3. Verse 3. Is it for do, watch this, for do we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Do we walk in the flesh, we dwell here, right? Right? We live here. It says, do we walk, we, we act. We move around. We do things in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. Give me the next verse. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. This is the reason we cannot war according to the flesh. The reason we cannot war according to the flesh is because the weapons that we use for our war, they are not of flesh. They are not physical. They are not AK-47. You get what I'm saying? So imagine someone sends you to war and he says, take, I've given you a weapon. And then, he says, where's the weapon? So no, I've given you, just go. And then you go and think, oh, they say we're going to fight war. And then you're going to meet people that carry physical guns. That's the day you realize that, hey, where's my weapon? <laughs> Praise God. So he tells you from the beginning, he says, hey, we walk after the flesh, but we do not war according to the flesh. We, we, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war according to the flesh. Hey, we have weapons, but those weapons are not carnal. They are not physical. But what do they do? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Watch this scripture now. I'm going to explain something to you. He said we have weapons. And the purpose of those weapons is for the pulling down. So those weapons are mighty in God. Remove God from those weapons, they don't work. So he says those weapons are mighty in God for one reason. And what is the reason? The pulling down of what? Strongholds. Next verse. Casting down what? Arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We have a weapon. And this weapon is used for one thing. We use it in God to pull down strongholds. What are strongholds? Those are the things he began to explain here. Casting down arguments. Casting down arguments. Someone say arguments. Arguments. We cast down arguments. We cast it down. Listen, what are these arguments? When he says for the pulling down of strongholds, what is he talking about? I know you've heard all those messages that are in our village there's one stronghold. There's one tree. You see that tree? That nobody dares go near that tree. Anybody that touches that tree dies in seven days. Say so that's a stronghold. So now people start going, uh, even believers start going to see how they can bring down that tree. 
You understand what I'm saying? Now, there is nothing wrong with the tree. The tree is a normal tree. Are you getting what I'm saying? But then there is an argument someone had brought and tied around that tree that had formed a stronghold on that tree. Years of believing, years of sowing those words. Someone came and said, ah, somebody thought that the person died in seven days. And like, do you understand what I'm saying? And they begin to tell stories and stories and stories and stories. Then soon everyone is taken captive by those stories, not by the tree, but by the stories that they have told about the tree. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So now everybody believes. They say, ah, that tree don't even go there. Ah, hey, no, don't go there. In this our place, ah, anybody that gives birth to twins, you, you know those stories. See, before people began to kill twins, you know, in those days, before people began to kill, kill twins, there was a weapon. Are you understand what I'm saying? There was a stronghold that was built around it. Hey, twins are not good. Ah, they are evil. And then they began to show examples. Now, in those things that they began to say, they began to form strongholds. Are you getting what I'm saying? They began to form strongholds. Until someone shows up and says, no, this thing is wrong. And began to fight them and hide them. And then when they hide, you know, imagine, they, they say, go and kill these twins in the evil forest. They take them, go and hide them, take them to another village. And then those twins grow up. They are normal. They are, they are doing good. And, and say, see, see this one. Say, we, thought, ah, we thought they are dead. No, they didn't die. See them. They are doing well. They are the biggest farmers and warriors and everything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, nothing was wrong with twins. But someone had created imagination. Someone had created a stronghold consigning that thing. Same way with everything that we have to deal with in this life. There is nothing to it, but many strongholds have been created consigning those things. Now, strongholds are simply words. Are you listening to me? Words that have been caused, people have been caused to believe over and over and over, and they are beginning to reason that way. There are people that eat in a certain way. You understand what I'm saying? When you try, ah, why do you eat like that? I don't know, that's just me. That's just me. It's not just you. You believed, you saw it, you accepted, you believed it, and you began to function that way. So it has become a stronghold. Many things you believe in life, they are wrong, but they have become strongholds. Even in church, there are strongholds. You get to what I'm saying? There are strongholds. But now God is telling us that, hey, you have weapons I have given to you. And those weapons, they are for the pulling down of strongholds. How do you begin to pull down strongholds? Notice it says casting down arguments. Now, listen, from the very beginning, God had given them clear instructions about the garden, what to eat and what not to eat. Am I right? Am I right? Now, they were living fine until an argument came. That's all Satan did. He threw an argument in the, in the flow. Have God said, you shall not eat of every tree? Do you understand? That's how he threw it. Have God said, you shall not eat of every tree? Say, no, that's not what God said. You know, he, 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 he had a way to get at that. He didn't say, have God said, you shall not eat of this tree. He knew if he had said that, like, yeah, God said we should not eat of the tree. But he wanted to get her into an argument. So he goes, have God said you shall not eat of every tree. And then she reasoned, every tree. No, 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 that's not what God said. Though. Don't misrepresent God here. <laughs> Don't, but then he, he has gotten you into the argument. Don't misrepresent God. That's not what God said. So what did God say? Oh, God said, oh, you can eat of every tree. But that tree, we shall not even touch it. Lest we die. Now she now introduced something that was not accurate the way God said it. So he used that on it. On her. He said, but do you know you shall not surely die? Mm. Now she didn't, she didn't know so much about that part. But hey, guess what? An argument had come. And her responsibility was to do what? Cast down that argument that was her responsibility right there 
she was supposed to cast down that argument. Something is coming against the knowledge of God that you have received. Are you getting what I'm saying? God have told you this is the truth about this thing. Another argument is coming. That's not the truth about that thing. There is another truth concerning this. And now she began to weaver. She did not employ her weapon. Are you listening? Are you listening to what I'm saying? Now, guess what? It's the same thing with a lot of believers till this day. It has to do with your life. It has to do with every day of your life. You don't realize that you're dealing with strongholds. You are dealing with arguments. These things have so shaped your life, you don't realize it. Many of us cannot even find the mind of God in a lot of things anymore. We can't. Because the arguments have become so great. The strongholds have become so great. We so believe in these things that we now look, instead of casting them down, we start now looking for how to manage with them. Why? Because we lack the very vital thing that God gave us from the beginning, the knowledge of good and evil. Because we lack that, we allow the strongholds to reign over our lives. So there, is, there are things that will happen and someone say, ah, if, 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 you know, for example, say, for example, they say, a fool at 40 is a fool forever, right? Right? And someone clocks 40 and he looks at his life, he has not gained anything in his life. And then he now remembers that what a fool at 40 is, then he interprets it to mean if you've not built your house, if you've not uh, gotten a hundred million by 40, you are useless. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, where did that start from? A statement, a fool at 40 is a fool forever. Now, he begins to imagine his life that if I have not achieved anything by this time, maybe he's a lady. Oh, I'm 40 years old, not married. Ah, will I ever get married? Why? Because see that 40 mark. Ah, why do you believe like that? A weapon, a stronghold have been implanted and you believed it. You believed it. No matter, now God may have spoken to you and told you how great you're going to be. God may have spoken to you and tell you, you're going to be the mother of many nations, just like he spoke to Sarah. You, maybe in your 20s, you were having that fellowship with God. Are you getting what I'm saying? You're praying and enjoying, and God told you, look, I have, I have blessed you with nations. Out of you shall come nations. Out of you shall come children. Who, he has spoken to you all those things. And you carry those things in your heart. And now you're clocking 40. Or you've, you, you just clocked 40. And then you now look at all those things and say, Ah, I've crossed 40. These things have not happened. Then guess what you begin to do? You begin to look at your life. Where did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? And then if you don't deal with it, you move to the next level. Like, look, I better just manage life as. I better adjust myself to accept life the way it has presented itself to me. Well, even if I don't get married, let me um, start doing something meaningful with my life. And then somebody even comes at that stage that, hey, I want to marry. Is there any need to even get married? Because I'm even wondering, should I, should I start giving birth at 40? Will I, will I? You know, so you, know, you begin to think all those thoughts. Then you begin to listen to stories that, ah, people that give birth, you know, at those kind of age, the children may be autistic, the children will be young, 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 plenty talk. And then all those things are strongholds. Now, what are they doing to this person? It is exalting itself against the knowledge of God that has been given to that person. See, that's why, first and foremost, before you start life, you should start life on this, on this premise. What has God said? Are you listening to me? What has God said concerning your life? You See, I tell you all the time, if you don't know this, you better go and lock yourself and fast and pray. And let the word of God come to you about your life. I'm not saying go and ask God, what should I be in life? Should I be a doctor or should I be a pilot or should I be? That's not what I'm talking about. See, stay with God until God confirms to you that he's giving you plans for your life. 
Those plans are not when you're 10 years old, you'll be this. When you're 20, you'll be this. That's not what I'm talking about. There, there is a word. There is a word that must come for your life. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Abraham, God spoke to him. says, I will make you a father of many nations. That is a word. That word was for Abraham. It's not for you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? That word was for Abraham. I will make you a father of many nations. And all this while God was speaking, God never spoke about Sarah. Do you know that? Do you know that? He never spoke about Sarah. But then Sarah was Abraham's wife. And God kept promising him, say, look, I will give you children. And one day God said, come out, count the stars. See if you can count them. He was trying. God said, so shall your seed be. And he knew God was talking about children. So shall my seed be. How? How? He watched his wife become old and old and old and old until he got to that point where he said, ah, this woman, nah, uh-uh. He, he, he go hard. Then the suggestion came. He woke up from a dream and shared the dream with Sarah, his wife. I said, I just had this dream. God said this. God said, I'll have a child. And God said, really? And, and Sarah's mind went to work. He will have a child. Me, I cannot give birth. I've passed the age of giving birth. So what do we do? He will have a child. Hey, this is my slave. She's a young girl. And she's my slave. Okay? So because she's my slave, I can give her to my husband to be have children for me. Surrogacy. surrogacy. <laughs> so you take the children, get pregnant, but the children will be my own. That was the deal. And she's like, yeah. That should be what God is saying. Oh, no wonder this girl has been with us for this long. <laughs> you know? And then began to qualify that whole thoughts and ideas. And said, um, my Lord, I would say he called him Lord. Lord, Abby, yes. Um, you know, I was thinking, that thing you shared with me in the morning, yeah? Uh, this is what I'm thinking. And I think this is what the meaning of that dream you had is. Really? You want to give me your maid said, no, it's not like I'm giving her to you. She's just going to bear children for you. And then they'll be my children. And Abraham thought of it. I said, hmm, yeah, this could have been what God is saying. You see, what happened? Through Sarah, an argument had come. Meanwhile, God had spoken to Abraham. His job was to do what? Pull down that stronghold. But he did it. He flowed with the idea Ishmael was born. But you know the story. He came back to his senses. And God showed up and said, hey, Abraham. Now that was the first time God was now telling him, say, as for Sarah, your wife. You see, that's the reason you must learn this thing with God. When God is talking to you concerning things, try to be specific with God. You get what I'm saying? Be specific with God. That's why I love Peter. When Jesus was telling Peter, follow me. The Bible says in John chapter 21, Peter turned around and saw John, you know, walking. And Peter had to ask John, what about this one? What will he do? Right? And Jesus said, what is it to you if I say he should stay till I come? You, follow me. Okay. At least we'll mention John. Are you getting what I'm saying? So all this while God was talking to Abraham, I'll give you some. Abraham could have simply asked, Lord, what about Sarah, my wife? Are you getting what I'm saying? God would have given him the word from the beginning. But God never told him about Sarah. So the day God now said, and as for Sarah, your wife, she will no longer be called Sarai, but Sarah. For she will, the Bible says, Abraham fell down and laughed. And when he finished laughing, he said, can Sarah, this one, he imagined her becoming pregnant. Why was it difficult to imagine a woman that was 90, <laughs> 90 years old? Why was it difficult to imagine that woman pregnant because of stronghold? It was not a normal thing. But hey, it was normal before, do you know? It was normal before. Adam lived 900 and something years. How old do you think his wife, Eve, lived? You think she died at 70? 
<laughs> That's what I'm saying. So maybe at year, year 400 and something, they were still giving birth to children. Because the Bible said they had many sons and daughters. Not only Cain and Abel and Seth they had. They had many sons and daughters. So age 400 and something, the woman was still becoming pregnant <laughs> and giving birth. You understand what I'm saying? All those people that lived. So when did this whole menopause thing start? Are you getting what I'm saying? It's a stronghold that was introduced and we began to believe it and believe it. And you know the thing about strongholds? They enter you until they become so real that they form a barrier around you. An experiment they did, they put a grasshopper in a glass, lead, a, a, a glass container, right? And put a lead on it. And this, this grass, this, you know how grasshoppers can jump? It will jump, hit the lead, jump, hit the lead, jump, hit the lead, jump. After a while, guess what? They remove the lead. This grasshopper will jump to that same height and go down. It will jump to that same height and go down. See, what has happened? A stronghold has been formed. It has, it has accustomed to the fact that we don't go above that level. That's the highest we can go when we jump. But God says we have a weapon. The weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. They are mighty through God. And for this reason, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, casting down arguments. How many arguments are going on in your life right now? Most times, identity arguments. How many are going on in your life right now? It says, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, when he says that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, he's referring to the things God have told you, the things God have taught you. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, there is the general word of God that we will believe, you know, oh, his plan concerning us, they are good and not evil, okay? So, okay, so I expect good things to happen to me. Those are general things. But you must go beyond that general one. You must go to the point where you know specific things God has said to you about you. Now, when you get those things, it becomes your weapon. It becomes your weapon. What do you do with it? Every argument that comes, what do you do? You cast that argument. You don't cast your, your own word down. You don't cast the plan for God for your plan of God for your life down. It is that argument you cast what down. If you let it, it will swallow you up. It will swallow you up. God said, oh, I have made you a father of many nations. Eh, but I've passed the age. You remember when God visited Abraham and Sarah was by the door, is dropping, you know what they were talking about. And God said, according to the time of life, by this time next day, I'll come and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. She laughed. Do you know what she said? Do you know what she said? She said, will I have pleasure with my husband? So her problem was not even getting pregnant. I'm like, hey, how, how is this thing going to even happen. But what she did not even realize that there is such a thing as immaculate conception. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's something God can do. She never realized that. So her problem was not like that. Ah! How? When God gives you a word, he has everything at his disposal to bring forth that word that he has given you. Even if there are things you have never heard about, there are, you don't have every information when God is concerned. If God tells you, I'm going to bless you tomorrow, hey, don't start thinking. If God tells you, I'm going to make you a billionaire tomorrow, you know, you look at you and say, hey, me, who do I know that can even give me one million? You think your whole history, carry your phone, go to your Facebook, look at all your friends. You can't find one person that God has blessed that you can just tell yourself that maybe this is the person God will touch. <laughs> God is telling you, I'll make you a billionaire by two. He didn't say in 10 years' time, he said by tomorrow. How? How will this thing ever happen? You know, so, so the point that someone has say, you know, so maybe you're just sharing with someone, ah, I don't know, I was praying and I heard God say he would make me a billionaire by tomorrow. I said, ah, maybe you just be walking on the road and somebody just give you one billion. Say, you know, you know what, come on, ah, I will just wait. 
<laughs> have, you, have you met people like that? They say, ah, I'll just faint. Why? Because you could not imagine. You remember the, 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 the children of um, the, the Samaria, when Samaria was surrounded and there was no food in the city, there was so much scarcity, people began to eat their children. Then the king sent someone to Elisha. Then Elisha gave a word of prophecy, said, tomorrow about this time, food will be this cheap. And someone heard, he said, you know what he said? Even if God opened the windows of heaven, it's not possible. It's not possible that food will become that cheap. It's not possible. It's like declaring that tomorrow about this time, it will be $100 to one naira. I didn't say 100 naira to one dollar. I say $100 to one naira. Imagine saying that kind of thing. You will think and think. And you now remember in this Tinubu's government, <laughs> even I want to tax everything. <laughs> so even if it's possible, they even allow. See, you, you think of the, all the possibilities I say is impossible. The knowledge they all didn't have is that just across, not too far from their fence, is food piled up enough that will cause that to happen. They didn't know. But when God spoke, he spoke because he was aware. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Did the word of God come to pass? Yes, it did. And it, it, if you look at the story, it, wasn't, it, it didn't look like magic. It looked like time and chance happening. Four lepers woke up and said, hey guys, nobody's giving us food here again. These lepers were at the gate of the city. So they say, it's so bad. Now what do we do? If we, if we knock, 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 they can open the gate too. But the fact that they are not even bringing food to toss at us again should tell you that there's no more food in the city. So if we go into the city, we die. Okay, the enemy that they are locking the gate of the city, they are over on this other side. If we go to them, they can kill us or they can save us. At least we know there's food there. Can we go there? What if they kill us? Then we die. <laughs> Four lepers made that decision and then they left only to get to the camp of the enemy. And guess what? They saw nobody. Not that they, they see, not just that they saw nobody. They, 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 they saw the horror because they were seeing shoes, clothes on the road. Like, ah, what happened here? It looks like these people were in a hurry to leave. Ah, when they have carried everything, let's just open the tent and see. They enter into the tent. They saw food, gold, silver, everything. Who carries gold and silver? You didn't capture them from war. You left your country to go and fight war. Why are you carrying gold and silver and all those things for? Are you going to give gifts to your enemies? But you see, you see, when God tells you a thing, it's not the day he tells you he has started planning it. So if God tells you, I'll make you a billionaire tomorrow, it's not that time he tells us, uh, uh, Michael, come, come, come. I promised my daughter. What do we do? What? No. Before he comes to tell you, he has formed the infrastructure already to cause it to happen. But strongholds begin to war against you. Who do you know? Auntie, who do you know? Uncle, who do you know? Maybe you've been battling with the sickness for so long. And God tells you by tomorrow morning you'll be healed. Ah, this thing, I have taken all the drugs. I have, I have done this, I have done this. You know how you argue with God? Remember the man by the, by the pool of Bethsaida? Jesus God said, do you want to get well? Ah, the problem is I don't have anybody to push me. Hey, just said, see, he didn't say, okay, let me pray for you now. He didn't. He just said, get up, carry your bed and go home. Imagine what went through the man's mind. And Jesus didn't make noise about it. It was a very quiet conversation. Do you know that? Very quiet conversation. Nobody knew Jesus was there. Nobody even knew the man. I believe, because the Bible said there were many sick people in that place. So imagine a place filled with sick people. And Jesus went there quietly. 
told one man, get up, carry your bed and go home. And he left. And the man carried his bed. I'm sure the people looking at him say, hey, this man has been deceiving us since. Hey, because I believe it's possible in that place people used to come and dash their money to it. Do you understand? <laughs> say, hey, this man, can you imagine? Do you understand what I'm saying? But thank God the man believed the words of Jesus against the words of his condition. Get up, carry your bed, and go home. How now? How? As the angel go? <laughs> because the stronghold, the idea then was the water will be stirred, then you jump in first. And Jesus didn't say, come, let me throw you. The angel is about to come. He didn't say that. And that's the thing I love about Jesus. He doesn't follow the normal process. That's why you must know and believe that he will not follow the normal process to lift you up. Oh, give me, give me Psalm, Psalm 127. Psalm 126. Verse 1. We'll end there. Psalm 126, verse 1. 127. Yeah. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Next verse. It is vain. Watch this. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow. For so he gives his beloved sleep. No, you didn't understand this. Give me the CEV. CEV. This is verse 2. Do you have CEV there? Give me the Amplified. Watch this. It is vain for you to rise up early, to take rest late, to eat the bread of anxious toil. For he gives what? Blessings to his beloved in sleep. Now he's telling you that this is how God reasons. This is how God thinks. God thinks it is vain for you to wake up early in the morning and then sleep late. What's the matter? Ah, I have to sort my daily bread. You know how people talk. I have to get my daily bread. I have to get food. He says, it is vain for you to rise up early and sleep late for this purpose. Why is it vain? He said, because God, your father, gives blessings to his beloved even when they are sleeping. You know what that means? When they do nothing. Praise God. Praise God. Say it is vain. But stronghold will not allow people function in this. You see believers every day wake up running, helter skelter. Oh, I must get a job. Oh God, give me a job. Yeah, prayer. God, give me a job. God, give me a job. God, give me a job. It's good to have jobs. Do you understand what I'm saying? But see, understand that, look, I'm a child of God. I will not get a job because I want... You know what it's called? Bread of sorrow. Huh? You know what bread of sorrow is? Salary. That's, what, that's, how, that's how God sees it. If you're earning salary, God sees it as bread of sorrow. Because why did he call it bread of sorrow? Now, because he say bread of sorrow, it doesn't mean it's bad. See, sometimes this is part, part of stronghold. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It simply means it's, it's a bread you don't get until you exact labor. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's why I call it bread of sorrow. So you would not want to do that on a normal day, but you have to so that you can earn that bread, right? Talk to me now. Is it every day you feel like going to work? Some days you don't feel like it, but you have to get up and go. Why? That's why I now say, see, see that thing you're not happy about, but you have to do it. That's why I call it bread of sorrow. It's vain. If you think that is your only way of survival, then it's vain. Because the reason is vain, because your father has the ability 
to give you blessings when you're sleeping. That sleeping means when you're doing nothing. Stand up on your feet. <clears throat> the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life in showing you what is good and what is evil is in this aspect also. So that you can cast down imaginations. So that you can cast down every thought, every idea that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in your life. Who told you it's too late for you to do well? Who told you it's too late for anything to happen in your life? Who told you it's too late? Strongholds. But what has God said concerning your life? That's what you must enforce. See, you have the Holy Spirit now to know that what God has said is day. Are you getting what I'm saying? What I'm experiencing is darkness, right? It's night. So your job now is to cause the day, which is what God has said, to manifest in your darkness. Lift up your hands and say, Father, I want you to mean these words right now. Say, Lord, open my understanding for my life to know good and evil. Open my understanding for my life to know good and evil. So I will begin to cast down imaginations, arguments, everything that tries to exalt itself against your knowledge in my heart against every word you have spoken to me from tonight i rise with the ability of the holy spirit in me to pull down those strongholds i will never accept an argument that exalts itself above your knowledge above your word in the name of Jesus Christ I live I function by your word in the name of Jesus amen and I declare you will continue to have testimonies testimonies that show that his word is exalted in your life testimonies that show that his good word is exalted above everything in your life in the name of the lord jesus christ thank you father we give you praise in jesus mighty name we pray amen